Hi, it's Lori again. Today we're going to be going over the workflow between Blender and Painter to create a candle. My assignment for this demonstration was to create a variety of decorative candle shapes as a universal prop for multiple scenes, such as an apartment. My first step was to Google for burned candles, melted candles, real wax candles, and the like to get a better idea of what realistic candles look like after being lit. As references go, molded plastic objects have the disadvantage of being another artist's interpretation of what an object looks like so I'd advise against using those as style references. On the other hand, the extremely melted realistic candles I found are more suited to a dramatic, moody scene than I was aiming for, so I picked my references carefully. Once I had a good idea of the art direction I was going for, I set up my scene in Blender with the units I used for Unreal. It occurred to me while I was filming that I would have an easier time just using Imperial units to begin with and let Blender do the conversion for me by switching to metric after but I decided to go ahead and show you how I figured out a realistic height and radius for the first candle. To get the width of the candle, I divided the reference diameter of three inches in half and then used Google to convert inches to meters. I added a six-sided cylinder to my scene and in the tool panel, I pasted in the units. For the base mesh, I left the ends open and I let Blender do some of the UV mapping by choosing Generate UVs. Now I have the base structure for an easily subdivided four inch by three inch pillar style candle. Set the shading to smooth, and you can see why a six-sided cylinder is a good start for the base mesh. In edit mode, I select the bottom edge of my mesh, and then go to my spacebar search menu, where I search for Origin to Selected, which is a script I installed from a blog I will share in the description below. With my Origin now set to the base, I can press Alt-G to clear transforms, and my candle is now resting on the ground plane. I also use Control a to apply the rotation and scale, so my UV unwrap doesn't get wonky. You'll see that I left my cylinder open because when I extrude the edges, I get quads, which is preferable since you can't loop cut a triangle fan. This part is a bit of experimenting to get the desired thickness and depth of the melted area of my candle. Alt F fills the top of the finished wick with tries, which I can convert to quads with Alt J, increasing the max shape angle if I prefer. In this case though, the algorithm just isn't reading my mind, so it makes more sense to select and fill the verts one by one in such a small area. You generally want to maintain quads as long as possible during the modeling phase to make it easier to make clean loop selections. I wanted to show that little trick though, because it can be a huge time saver in a more complicated situation. Unfortunately, my lower menu was hidden here, but the screencast keys display gives us a play-by-play -play of what I'm doing. First, I select the original cylinder faces, which are already neatly laid out. I tried clearing all seams because, as you can see, if you choose seams from islands, each face is currently a separate UV island. I want to take advantage of the tidy generated layout, but with one seam going up the side. I clear seams again, and then, switching to edge select mode in the UV editor, I select just the edge at one side of the UV space, and with Control e I mark that as a seam. Then in the 3D viewport, Control u and unwrap. Flat surfaces like the top face loop of the candle, which I select with an Alt-right click on one of the perpendicular edges, won't fold in on themselves like a cylinder, so they can simply be unwrapped using Control u unwrap. If you get any UV warping here, you may have forgotten to apply scale to your mesh earlier. I want the inner faces of the melted part unwrapped flat, just like the outer faces. It's a cylinder too, so I mark a seam that lines up with the same edge loop. And select just that face loop again, Control u and unwrap. Now you can see an advantage to not having a triangle fan on top. I can select the face loop with just a click and Control u to unwrap. Later, when you're optimizing the base mesh, you can split the geometry for the wick away from the candle, remove edge loops from the wick with correct UVs enabled, and merge the center verts of the candle top, which will cut the number of tries by more than half. The rest is more of the same. Select, mark seams as needed, and unwrap. For good measure, I clear seams again, choose UVs, and mark seam from islands. That way I know that I can pack them and select them together as intended. 
You can run the automatic packing with Control-P in the UV view and adjust the pack margin in the tool panel as I did here. But once you have all the UV islands unwrapped, their relative scale is out of proportion. For example, the wick would have the same texture resolution as the candle this way. So I select the entire mesh and tap Control-A in the UV view to average the scale of all the islands. Another automatic pack lets me get an idea of how these individual pieces might be puzzled together most efficiently. And running Unwrap in the 3D viewport again with your seams properly marked might get you an even better arrangement. I like this pack, but I might want to stitch the cylindrical shapes to their caps. Using Control V with the target edge selected and then toggling between the results with I, you can stitch any two UV islands that are connected on the mesh itself. I may just undo that and leave the wick connected as one island for now. Now I want to set up my smoothing groups, which is done a little differently in Blender than other modeling software. Everything is currently set to smooth, so what I need to do is select the edges I want sharp, which again is easier to do with quads as you can select an entire face loop with Alt, right click, and then in the select menu, choose select boundary loop. Control E to mark the edges sharp. I'll finish up my smoothing groups using Auto Smooth in just a moment. First, I wanted to make some more experimental adjustments. Making the wick longer or the top deeper, always keeping in mind that the next stage is where I'll add variations and sculpt high res details to bake from. So, this shape needs to stay somewhat generic. As a final step, I'll select all and remove doubles to make sure I haven't accidentally extruded while marking edge loops or otherwise duplicated parts of my mesh inadvertently. Before I move on, I need to finish setting up my smoothing groups for baking, making sure that Auto Smooth is enabled under the Data tab. At first, I think I might like a sharp edge on top, which could be appropriate for a brand new candle, but melted candles are rounded and have a softer edge, so I bump up the angle a bit more until all the unmarked edges are smooth. You'll see that the marked edges on the wick remain sharp. Continuing with my final adjustments, I make sure and re-unwrap any time I resize the geometry. Otherwise, big textures may stretch and warp. Now that I'm happy with my base mesh, I'm going to duplicate it and start to work on some variations. My art lead requested about five candle variations, so I googled the dimensions of common candle types and modified my duplicate candles to fit, applying the scale afterward. The adjustments I make after this point are mainly creative, but I do make sure to re-unwrap my meshes after every big change to make sure that the UVs remain clean. Here I'm selecting the top edges in vertex select mode to add a little procedural randomness with the randomize tool. After you press this button, you can adjust the strength and direction of the randomize effect infinitely until you click away or perform another action. The noise button in the tool panel can provide a similar, more controlled effect, but utilizes an image set up through a material, which is a lot more complex than we really need right now.
Now that I have a set of base meshes I am happy with, I'll duplicate them and get ready to add some high res details. I like to use the add-on called Name Panel to quickly rename batches of meshes in Blender this way. You can find a link to purchase Name Panel in the description below. As you can see, if you make lots of typos like I do, it can save you a ton of hassle down the line, like when you can't figure out why your baker isn't recognizing the high poly mesh. I prefer to keep my high and low poly bake meshes on a different layer from my final export mesh to stay organized. So with my bake meshes selected, I press M, select the next layer, and they're moved. I press 2 and my view changes to the second layer where my duplicates are. From this point on, my low poly bake mesh is going to remain almost identical to the game asset, except when I need to add removable edge loops to help my normal mat bake out more accurately. If I make any more significant changes to the low poly bake mesh, I'll need to replace the game asset with it and change the name. With my low poly mesh hidden, I enter edit mode and clear the seams and sharps from what will become my high poly mesh, and I turn off auto smooth. I don't know why, but I've found that the high poly mesh needs to be smooth all over and sharpened with bevels where needed, rather than using the shading tricks of auto smooth and sharp marks. Otherwise, normal maps won't bake properly. I'll show you how I smooth and sharpen the high poly mesh in just a moment. Here I'm turning off auto smooth, and then using the copy to selected option to propagate that setting to all the other selected meshes. I'll add a subsurf modifier here, and you'll see that my base mesh sort of collapses. In object mode, I increase the subdivisions, select my other meshes again, and then use Ctrl L to link the modifier on the first object to the rest. Some amount of roundness is the look I'm going for here, but not this much. In fact, some of my references have a different amount of sharpness on the inner and outer edges. My first instinct was to bevel the whole top face loop with Ctrl B, but I quickly realized that's not right. I need to bevel only the inner and outer edge loops, so under Select I choose Select Boundary Loop, and now my bevel is having the effect that I wanted. By scrolling the mouse wheel I can increase and decrease the bevel segments on the fly, but again so long as I don't click away I can adjust the bevel settings infinitely in the tool panel. I think a big soft bevel looks about right so I'll leave it at that. I started to sharpen the wick up again and selected the top and bottom edges, but then I decided to save that for later. I liked these bevel settings, so I decided to jump to the next mesh where I can use them again with a simple Control B and Enter. Toggling clamp overlap resolves the weirdness that ensued when I applied the same settings to a smaller edge loop. I want to change the angle of the slope here, but I can't see the edges I want to grab due to the modifier, so a quick solution is to turn off the visibility of the modifier. Any of these buttons are handy in different situations, so I encourage you to try them all. I apply a bevel there too, and now my second candle has a slightly sharper edge, making it look a bit less melted than the first. When I apply the bevel to just the outer edge of the third candle, I realize I like the effect, so I undo my changes and set new bevels accordingly. This is another stage where creativity reigns, so you may just want to watch as I test and discard a few different options. Note that the smaller your bevel, the sharper the edge will appear. Use this to your advantage, but don't go too far. No edge in real life is perfectly sharp, so even on a hard surface, you want to add a very slight bevel to create what are called contour normals in your bake. This is how I get the wick edges sharp enough for realism.
It looks like I have an end gun here, which means my low poly mesh has one too. I'll have to remember to fix that in a moment, but it doesn't hurt to leave it there in the high poly version, or even the low poly bake mesh. Before I forget, I'll switch to my game asset version and use the hotkey J to cut a proper edge between the verts. I'm selecting my other meshes just to be sure that's the only one I missed. For my really melted candle, I want to add a little drip detail. So to make it conform perfectly to the curvature of the mesh, I'm going to cheat and duplicate some faces. This isn't necessary, but it's non-destructive and it saves me some time not having to line up brand new geometry in just the right spot. Since everything's a little skewed now, I'll align my view to one of these faces with Shift, Number Pad 7, and then change my transform orientation to View while I scale these pieces. This keeps my transforms aligned to the surface that I'm looking at. Since this is my high poly bake mesh, I don't have to worry about being efficient or clean topology. I can simply extrude these faces upward to give them some thickness. Then it's just a matter of pushing and pulling and checking with the modifier enabled until I get the drip looking just how I want. The subsurf modifier and the normal bake will hide a multitude of sins. And that is it. Join me again next time when I'll be exporting these assets from Blender and bringing them into Substance Painter, where I'll use an unexpected material and shader from Substance Share to build a convincing wax texture. Thank you for watching. Let us know what you think in the comments below and feel free to ask us questions. Be sure to subscribe for more videos like this one from the Timefire VR team.